Well, I'm excited to be here. So you've gotten to hear Rob's stories, and I want you to be able to hear mine a little bit. I'm going to balance it. Susie, I love you. I'm going to balance it a little bit um, and tell you the behind-the-scenes stuff that maybe you haven't heard. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my mother, Henrietta, was born Jewish. And um, so I have a Jewish heritage, though I've never practiced Judaism, and she really didn't either. Um, she was orphaned at 16 and had a 14-year-old brother, so she had a difficult life. Um, my father was a good old boy from Oklahoma, and he never finished the eighth grade. In fact, my father, uh, when he retired from Aerojet as a painter, I feel like I'm in a Hollywood production here. I, I, I don't know whether to dance or sing or I don't know. Um, so <laughs> this is going to be a good one, Bob. This is going to be a good one. Good luck. Um, my father never made more than $8 an hour his whole life. My father's family had 10 children, and his father uh, was actually blown up in this accident. And they had to travel around till they could find a place that was more comfortable for him. And so my father went to work to help to support the family, and his father died when he was 16. So my parents had kind of rough upbringings. And uh, my parents loved me very much, but my mother was bipolar, and we used to call it manic depressive, and she never took her medication correctly in her whole life. <laughs> so it was, um, there was some difficult times, and I never felt uh, like I did anything right. I didn't feel like I could please her, and that was a theme throughout my life. Um, my family did not attend church. They were great people, but they didn't attend church. But a friend of theirs would pick me up and take me to church in their Cadillac every Sunday, the Carnahan's. And I, knowing myself, the first time I heard the gospel, I'm sure I asked Jesus to be my Savior. I can't remember back to a time um, that I didn't know him. Rob would say that he comes from a rugged family where love was not verbalized, his parents fought continually, they hated one another, and they asked Rob to choose, which he would not do. So, so Rob and I met in the fifth grade. Um, we went to school together and church together. And um, he was quiet and reserved and athletic. He played a lots of sports and was good in all of them. I was my cheerful self unless I was fighting with my mother. Then I was in tears. Um, Rob quickly became our, as you know, he's a great teacher, and he became at uh, 17, 18 years old, our teacher for our youth group. And he, one weekend, we went on a retreat, and he, we all split after the retreat, and Rob stayed and helped my mother, who was a chaperone, clean the cabin. And she came home and told me she'd found a man for me. And I didn't take her up on it till we were a senior in high school. We started dating as we were senior in high school. And we were married when Rob was 20 and I was, Rob was 21 and I was 20. And the truth is, we really didn't know each other at all. Um, I think he's told you before when we took a personality test when they rated us on expressive, I was a 98 and Rob was a two. And that's kind of how our life was, just way worlds apart. Um, the one thing that we both scored equally high on was anger. We both were angry, so we, we had one thing in common. And um, Rob's mother taught him, never trust a happy person. But he married me anyway. And it took him a few years to believe that I was not going to knowingly hurt him. Um, I went to, was involved in Campus Crusade and lots of Christian things. And somewhere along the line, I came to the conclusion that if you love the Lord and your partner loved the Lord, God was just going to work it all out. And that marriage was going to be wonderful. Well, somewhere along the line, I think I was misinformed because marriage was very difficult for us, very difficult for us. We were brought up in a legalistic environment, 
and when God called Rob into the ministry, we taught what we knew. Legalism makes you look at the world through critical eyes, not only yourself, but others. And it's, it's a trap. And it took us a long time. When we went to Pioneer Bible Church, our oldest daughter was three months old. And uh, they passed her around like she was a pancake. <laughs> they just, they loved her. And she's going to be 50 next week. So um, we both love the Lord, Rob and I. We wanted to please him. We wanted to be married and be happy. But we didn't have a clue. Um, I never had big career aspirations. Perhaps that's because my mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, but I just wanted to be a wife and a mother. And then I wanted to be a pastor's wife. That was what was on my heart. God blessed us with four amazing daughters. And as you can imagine, our thoughts on parenting were like this. Um, Rob's parents had not expressed love to him, but only criticism. My mother was hard to please, and there was a lot of fighting and tears, so we were ill-equipped for relationships and parenting. Um, what became my, pro my practice was that whenever I was upset, which was a lot, I read the Psalms, and I would just go to the next one and the next one, and Psalm 103 became my all-time favorite. The first line of that song is, Bless the Lord, O my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I would cry out to Jesus in these times when it was so hard, and he gave me so much comfort. <laughs> One time, we'd set up this lunch with this guy. I guess I'd set it up with Rob's friend, and he came, and it turned out Rob had a meeting, and it just was a mess, and I was crying, and I got to the psalm that said, he'll have regard for your burnt offerings. <laughs> And I knew, you know, God's got my back. He's okay. So one day as I was reciting Psalm 103 to myself and telling the Lord how hard my life was, he said to me, it just says, bless the Lord. It doesn't say if things are good. It doesn't say if things are easy. It just says, bless the Lord. I want you to do that as an act of obedience, whether you're happy or sad. And that was really helpful to me. Psalm 103 goes on to say why we should bless the Lord. Verse 3 says, he pardons all our iniquities. Well, the real truth was I thought most of our problems were Rob's. <laughs> I had a list of things that would make our life better if only he would change. And what I really meant is that I thought he should be more like me. Uh, I didn't do the big sins in life. I've never been drunk. I've never done drugs, smoked a cigarette for a weekend, ugh. And um, so I thought I was pretty good, and Rob hasn't done those things either, but God had to show me my pride, my um, self-righteousness, and some people sin in the depths, and some of us sin right here. And I was a right here kind of person. I was a very slow learner. Rob was very confused. He looked back at his home, and he was nothing like his parents. Why was I so unhappy with him being quiet and sitting in the corner or whatever? You know, he didn't know how to interact with the kids. It was difficult. Um, I thought that to get along, we had to become more and more alike. And I realize now that's not true. Verse 4 says, he redeems your life from the pit. You ever been in a pit? <laughs> I loved our congregation. And there were times when I really thought about leaving and that we just weren't going to make it. But I love that church too much to break it apart. And I knew if we separated, that church would fall apart. And so I stayed. And I'm really thankful because... Um, we have a wonderful life now, and I would have missed that. So many people miss that. They quit too soon. And this, if you've quit too soon, this is no judgment. I don't want to judge anybody. There's not a judgmental bone in my body here about this. But if you know people that are struggling, tell them not to quit too soon. Um, again, God began to show us that legalism is a trap. And we began to learn more about the grace of God. And I really think part of why... Um, I just need, I felt like I needed to earn God's love somehow. 
I think that legalism provided that if you do this, you'll be okay, and if you do that, you'll be okay. And the truth is, God's looking at our hearts. Um, so a woman in our church paid for a trip to a Christian counseling center because she thought it would help us help others. When we got there for our 10-day stay, we realized that this Christian counseling center uh, that we were there for was for messed up pastors and missionaries. And we had 10 days there and God used it to change our life. You don't know what you don't know, right? We had both studied the Bible and prayed and asked God to fill us and help us in our marriage. And we, we did know how to ask forgiveness so we'd come back together, but same things would happen. Um, we were committed to staying together no matter what. We were people who loved the Lord, but we had no tools. We had come from families who had no idea how to train us on relationships, and we had no clue. And when I say that, I'm not blaming parents. They did the best they knew how. They didn't know how to do it either, right? <laughs> how can you train something you don't know? Um, so we began counseling, and God began to show us areas that we needed to change and how to do that. We learned how to talk to each other and we learned how to listen. We could have bought a very nice car or gone on vacations, but we went to counseling instead. <laughs> and we have for years and still continue to, and we don't regret a penny. Some people left our church when they found out the pastor was going to counseling. You know, I've never quite understood that. If your heart had a problem, you'd go to the doctor You'd get medicine, you'd do surgery, but if your mental health or your brain needs help, all of a sudden, just read the Bible and pray. Well, we'd been doing that, folks. We'd been doing that. We needed some extra tools, and uh, I, I'm glad that in this day and age, I know there's a lot of abuse and a lot of craziness, but at least we're focusing a little bit on our mental health and saying that it's okay to do that. The deepest pit experience for me happened within about six to eight weeks. Uh, we were in Southern California with our oldest daughter, Mary Beth, uh, who was having her first child. It was not my first grandchild, but it was her first child. My daughter, Esther, called the hospital the next morning when we went in to see this baby, and I could hear from across the room, I could hear my daughter sobbing, and I knew my mother had died. I just knew she was gone. Um, I decided to stay that week with my daughter as I had planned, and my husband went home and he and my daughters started the process rolling for my mother's funeral. Well, my daughter Esther, who had picked her up, went to pick up my mom and found her, uh, was five and a half months pregnant. And when we went to the next, when she went to her next appointment, there was no heartbeat. So they wanted her to continue. They said the baby, you know, she would go ahead and give birth. And um, so I was in the delivery room with her and Johnny when baby Jesse was born. And, um, and then my dad died. And that was a pit, my friends. Um, my dad was in a rest home. He hadn't spoken in over a year. Um, but just the bang, bang, bang of it was a lot. I had never experienced depression. I'm a pretty naturally, I wake up happy. Um, I, did, I could always pull myself up by my bootstraps. I never had to worry about that. But I couldn't this time. And I, I learned a little tiny bit of what some of you face on a regular basis with depression. And it's, um, may God have compassion on us with that depression. Um, the second pit experience that God led me through involved mentoring a younger mom that was very needy and very, um, very messed up. And I remember God pointing her out to me and asking me to mentor her. And I was glad to do that. And I put my whole heart into it. And I fell in love with her. And after a few months, she'd never had anyone love her. And that scared her. And her, in her dysfunction, she, she had to make me bad. She had to push me away and discredit my family. And I was devastated. 
I mean, God led me into that relationship. And it took me about six months to trust him again. My thinking was, you know, if I'm, are you, you're leading me into something that's going to be this painful on purpose? I don't understand that. But God showed me that I was, I too quickly gave myself away. I didn't have boundaries. If anybody needed me, if anybody needed anything, I was right there. And that really wasn't healthy over lifetime. We have a decision to make who we give ourselves to and how deep we'll go. And I needed to learn that. So I forgave God. <laughs> um, Actually, he forgave me for not trusting him, but uh, we made peace and we went on. And my latest pit experience is losing my best friend, Marge. Uh, she was my everyday friend and we talked every day, even though at the end of her life she was um, bedridden. She taught me how to die with contentment. She taught me how to love and um, God's been very sweet to me during this time. And I have every confidence that we'll be mischief making again soon because I think you can make mischief a little bit in heaven. And she's there waiting for me. So the next verse says, he crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. It would take all day to tell you of the loving kindness and compassion that Rob and I have experienced. We were very poor in the beginning of our ministry. Our first paycheck from our church was $100, and our house payment was 206 There you go. Um, my daughter and I tease about it because they were also very poor, and we say now we're stupid rich. We're just stupid rich. Um, we had families fix up a car for us when we had our third child, and we couldn't fit three car seats in the back of a Volkswagen. People brought boxes of food to our door. People gave extra in the offering for our family month after month. People paid for our kids to be born. Figure that one out. They just, they knew the postmaster and the postmaster would put a little envelope in our mailbox. You couldn't do that today. Um, paid for our third child. They gave us cash for Christmas as a church, which meant we had a Christmas. Um, they bought clothes for our daughters when we could not. One time when our church was small, there was a gentleman who became a Christian around our age in the early 70s, and he wanted to be baptized, and it was fall, it was cold, and we didn't have a baptismal, so they went to the river. And Rob said, I think it'd be really good after the baptism if, if everybody could come back to our house and have a little bit to eat and warm up by the fire. And... Um, so I went and opened the pantry and it was pretty bare, but someone had just given me a lug of pears and I had some flour and sugar, so I made pear cobbler and everybody was warm and filled and there was a rather wealthy lady that as she was leaving said, I left a little something as a thank you on your refrigerator, on the top of your refrigerator. Well, my first thought was, oh my gosh, when was the last time I cleaned the top of my refrigerator? Right, women? Right? You know, ladies. Yeah. I mean, being short, I didn't see it. Out of sight, out of mind. So sure enough, I felt up there, and amongst the dirt, there was a $5 bill. And that kept us in macaroni and cheese for the next week. And we were good. Now, Rob is a very intelligent person. He's a diligent worker, and he could have made a lot of money. I can't make it through this part. <laughs> but neither of us wanted that. Neither of us wanted money over what God had called us to. I was in the career I wanted. I was a wife and a mother and a pastor's wife. Okay, verse 8 through 14 says that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward us who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, I don't know my east from my west, um, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful. We are but dust. 
I was, I was rehearsing that to my granddaughter, and she said, Grammy, what's butt dust? <laughs> oh, I love my grandchildren. We have nine grandchildren and a grandson-in-law. We are truly blessed. One turning point in our relationship was the book Love and Respect by Egrich. I was finally able to understand what Rob thought respect meant, which was not at all what I thought it meant or what I was trying to show. And little by little, through many tears and much talking, we have come to better understand each other and to be happily married. God began to show me that to be happily married did not mean that we agreed on everything. Uh, in fact, in a recent podcast I listened to, they said that 69% of the things that married couples hassle about cannot be, uh, they'll, they'll never be in agreement about it. We'll always look at those things differently. It's how we learn to compromise. It's how we learn to respect each other in our differences. And that, I wish I'd have known that 50 years ago. Darn it. But... Um, so I re began to respect the person Rob is, the way he's different from me, and to learn from the way he looked at the world. After 43 years in ministry, Rob was done. He was tired. He was worn out. Um, pray for your pastors and love them. And if you've got a great way they should tweak their sermon, don't tell them. Don't tell them. Rob was thrilled to retire, and I knew we should, but I was pretty devastated. That had been my life for 43 years. That was my social group. Those were my friends. We'd raised our kids together. So for the first six months after we re retired and we decided we needed to find a new church, um, for the first six months, I wept, just wept through worship every Sunday. And no one ever asked me about it. Um, we went to two great churches, but they weren't our church. And I didn't realize for me how much worship was, ver you know, horizontal and vertical. I, I worshiped with the people as well as worshiped God. And here I was in a room full of strangers. Oh, I hated it. Um, but God had to remind me that he'd come with me and I could still worship him in a room full of strangers. And so I did. I learned to. Fortunately, we only moved 45 minutes away, and so I still had friends there. And um, our daughter wanted to move uh, down to the Ponderosa School District. And that's a hard place to find property and a home to get into. And so we both sold our homes, and we bought this piece of property on the corner of Maverick Road in Ponderosa. And my son-in-law is an amazing contractor. He's fast, he's good. My husband and my daughter worked alongside him and we built two, they built two houses in a year. And we are blessed. I never dreamed at this age of, that I would have a new home that was an open concept. My little kitchen in Somerset, you could only be in the kitchen and you couldn't see anybody else or anything else. This is so wonderful. And I just, we love our home. We're 15 minutes from Costco. Y'all, we used to have to drive 25 minutes to get to Walmart, okay? This is amazing. I look out my window and I have deer and turkeys and big old jackrabbits. You guys have big old jackrabbits down here. And I love that. I, I love that. We have a shared garden and an above-ground pool that we maintain, my husband maintains for our grandkids. Um, we have a sweet, sweet life. We travel to Santa Clarita to see our oldest daughter, and her kids are all in college, but, and then we travel to San Diego to see our other daughter. And two of our daughters live locally, and we have family dinner every week with them. Um, I wanted to go to a church that was close to our home, and so I had seen Foothill Church, and I, I thought the Parsons went here. Parsons, we were old friends with the Parsons. And so when, I came, when we came here, I knew two people. Woohoo! That was better than a room full of strangers. And it took me almost two years to feel at home here. Uh, the people were wonderful, but you know how it is. If you come to a new place, you don't have those stories together. 
that you had with old friends. And now I'm, I'm meeting you and um, made some new really heart friends and happy to be here. Started in with Tuesday morning Bible study and then here at Wednesday afternoon and have met most of you. Um, I feel really silly talking about marriage to this group. Many of you have been married much longer than our 51 years. Um, but one of the things I've learned that's sad but true is that a long marriage doesn't necessarily mean a happy marriage. Happiness is, um, even for Christians, I've seen a lot of unhappily married people. So one of my personal core values is to be a lifelong learner. And I want to learn about my marriage, my business, being a parent, a grandparent, a friend. I'm always asking God to show me the next step. Rob and I continue to learn about each other, to grow in our love for each other. And we just started a new podcast series on marriage. You're never too old to learn till the day you're gone, right? So, um, and for those of you that are, have lost your mate, I hope this wasn't too painful. I didn't think about that till I got in this room and I just can't imagine what it's been like to lose a mate. I'm not looking forward to it. And I'll be knocking on your doors when that happens. Unless I go first. I won't be knocking. I know, I know, I know. He'll just say he's fine and just leave him alone, it's okay. Um, I realized a while ago that getting old, der, is not necessarily gonna be fun or easy. I, def I define worry as this. Worry is thinking about the future and leaving Jesus out of it. And Satan tries to scare me so many times. We've had a lot of death around us, haven't we? I mean, look folks, we're this age. We're going to know people that die far more than we did when we were younger. But um, Jesus is gonna be there as we age, as we need him, as we have pit experiences. Um, and so we can learn to say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul.